If anyone wants to come and sit up in the front, please do. There are two seats right here. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Feeling a little bit yeah. too distanced up here. <laughs> so I'm um, continuing this evening um, on the, the talk that I gave last time I was here really on the theme of um, craving and grasping, um, my favourite topic currently. <laughs> so this talk I'm calling Putting Down the Burden, and it's based on a, a discourse or a sutta in the Pali Canon, which is called the Bara Sutta. Um, and it, I think it provides um, a really lovely metaphor for the way in which we continue to um, create craving and suffering for ourselves. And there are four main aspects that the Sutta lays out. Um, it speaks about the burden. So this is the metaphor that the, the Sutta sets up. The burden, the bearer of the burden, the picking up of the burden, and the putting down of the burden. So I'll, I'll unpack that this evening. So I think um, the burden for me is a really powerful image of, of a weight, something that I'm carrying around or carrying that's, that's actually hard work. And I looked up some synonym, synonyms for burden and um, you might feel what happens in the body when I say these words, liability, millstone, load, yoke, encumbrance, drain, worry, affliction, and trouble. So you can see, you can, yeah, I can really feel the tone of that, the heaviness that's created in a way already just from speaking those words. So in the sutta, um, which is very similar um, to, the, to the first noble truth, the Buddha says that the burden is the five functions or modes of existence what are often called the aggregates that are subject to grasping. So this is what the Buddha defines as the burden in this sutta, the five functions of existence, our existence that are subject to grasping. And these aggregates, um, basically the, um, the commentaries and the, the Buddhist um, commentaries speak about these five functions as forming our, our whole human experience and they are body as form feelings and feelings um, are either pleasant unpleasant or neither pleasant nor unpleasant the third one is perceptions um, the way we perceive things um, the fourth one is conceptualizing and, and mental fabrication so you might say that it's it's the all the stories and the images that we apply to those perceptions and then consciousness and knowing itself. So they're the five functions of the human being, if, if you like. And this is what the Buddha is saying. Um, when they're subject to grasping, um, this is what creates the burden for us. So essentially, um, this is covering everything in our, in our human experience. And in various places in the teaching, the Buddha, the Buddha um, refers to either the five aggregates or he refers to the five aggregates subject to grasping. And I think this distinction here is really important because we can, uh, we can see that, that being in this body as form, it can, we can exist in this body without um, clinging onto it. You know, we can experience body in the body, we can experience the body as the body, just sitting here right now, breathing, as we've been practicing in this in this um, um, uh, practice this evening. So the aggregates exist in and of themselves; they're not always subject to clinging. But as the 
as the uh, clinging aggregates, this experience stops being just one of arising and passing away and flowing through us. And there's an urge or an impulse that becomes apparent or that, that is present all of a sudden. There's some compulsion to grab onto something and either pull it towards us, push it away, or we obsess about something that we haven't got yet that we want. So these are sort of the three movements. So it's this second definition that the Buddha is talking about in this sutta. So the burden here in this sutta is described as these functions of existence when they're susceptible to this grasping. And the next part of the, of the sutta, the bearer of the burden will you know, extrapolate on this. So what is bearing this burden? And the Buddha's response in this sutta is the person, the person named so-and-so from such and such a family. So the bearer of this burden right now, of me sitting here, this nervousness I'm feeling, sitting here speaking with you all, is Robin from the Gibson family. So this is what the Buddha is saying. When, when Katrina introduced me this evening, said, We're, we have Robin here this evening teaching. You kind of knew that she was referring to me. I knew she was referring to Robin Gibson. Um, so this is, a, this is a conventional way of, of referring to ourselves, right? I know this is Katrina, Amanda, yeah, Tatiana. So you might know me already, just to, just to um, extrapolate on this. You, may, you might know me already, or you might be seeing me tonight for the first time, but if somebody showed you a photo of me tomorrow, you would probably say, oh yeah, that's Robin Gibson. So you see how the, the Buddha is referring to the person here. It's in the conventional sense. And we might also, start asking but what, what is this person really you know who is this if there is no permanent self here but the buddha continually steers away from these questions back to the question of suffering and how do we create the suffering for ourselves rather than the metaphysical questions about who am i um, etc. So his invitation is to look really at the mechanisms or the strategies with which we continue to create suffering for ourselves. And that's what I love about this sutra and is that it's 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 got these four parts and it really um, it really uh, brings this this activity that we keep doing into really sharp um, relief. And I wonder also actually whether the Buddha is saying here as well by using the words, these words, the person, when I'm actually bearing some kind of emotional and psychological burden, there is actually someone here identifying with that. So our sense of self becomes actually very in some cases, incredibly um, strong. And, you know, we, we, we become very identified with something when we're, when we're really clinging on to something. So there is, there is someone here identifying with that burden and a sense of someone here in that moment doing something. So the sense of the person becomes larger in a way. And I wonder if that... If, if, the Buddha was referring to that activity as well. So this bearer of the burden, um, you know, we, we all know, I think, in our own ways, how we build these stories around this me at the centre based on the craving to be someone. And often they're very fragile stories, but we keep telling ourselves these same stories over and over. We build this persona around these perceptions and views that we hold, yeah? And, um, yeah, we, we keep trying to, 
solidify this person. So when we when we do pick up the burden, and yeah, I think the important thing is here that I think the, is what the Buddha is saying is that this is an activity that we keep doing, and one one that's so practiced we don't even question it. We're actually acting from the point of view of someone doing something. And in this, I think we stop trusting the flow of life living through us and we try to dam this flow somehow. So essentially the sense of self um, in this grasping mode is feeding on the clinging aggregates, feeding on um, the body in its particular function through the feelings, through the perceptions, and, the, and particularly, I think, the mental fabrications, all the stories and the, the ideas that we have about ourselves. Essentially, I mean, most of the time it's about me, right? In, in most cases, these stories are about me. But like the, the sense of self that we fabricate, the clinging aggregates are also quite insubstantial and they're impermanent. You know, the body ages and changes. Our feelings come and go. So do our thoughts. So, yeah, we're actually trying to nourish ourselves on something that's actually not that, not that nutritious, nutrition, nutritious. But still it can really weigh us down a lot. And so the picking up the burden that the Buddha is speaking about in the sutta, I think, you know, we all know how it feels in the body and the heart and the mind when we're carrying some form of unease or worry, however small, you know, something so small can niggle away at us so intensely. And we can feel the sense of self just kind of sticky and and uncomfortable around that. You know, it, we, there really is no free flow of life moving through us at that point. You know, I, was th I was thinking about how, you know, just even the most minor things like my, I was driving here tonight thinking um, one really mundane, but, you know, very pertinent example is my partner likes to wash the dishes with lots of soap and it drives me insane because <laughs> I'm drying the dishes and I'm the one with the you know the wet tea towel and you know I mean it doesn't matter right it doesn't matter if there's lots of soap it gets the dishes clean but my sense of righteousness around you know having to dry the dishes with a wet tea towel it it actually solidifies this sense of me against him and you know, the story just proliferates every time we go through this activity together. I mean, this is, this is, this is the reality and the, the futility of what we do, but it's, this, is, this is how um, uh, prolific it is. And we might ask, why do we actually want life to be other than it is right now? Why do we, why do we actually push and pull and ruminate on how much we want life to be other than it is. Isn't life just incredible as it is right now, you know, painful or otherwise? But we all know that our stories and views about, you know, what, what my life is and isn't are so much more compelling than actually what's happening just here now. Um, the teacher Reggie Ray says, we love drawing conclusions about ourselves. Essentially, we're, we're constantly trying to set our self image in concrete. And our ultimate addiction in service of this is thinking. And particularly our habitual thinking and holding views and these as I said, are usually about me and mine. 
And uh, Glenn Wallace says, we humans are virtuosos of agitated effort. And I really, I really love that quote. We humans are virtuosos of agitated effort. So putting down the burden, what's, what's this putting down the burden? And I think what the, the Buddhist uh, saying in this sutta is this, this actually is the strategy for freedom he's offering in this, in this sutta. Well, it's, it's actually just, just that, just putting it down. But we all know that we can't just drop these stories and views just like that. It's easy to say, just let go, especially when this requires no effort whatsoever. Um, you know, it's as simple as that. But we can't let go. I think I was um, talking about this in the last talk about doing. We can't let go until we're well and truly done with carrying the burden. When we've really had enough and when the self realises the, fu the futile struggle of the carrying of the burden, the letting go happens naturally in its own time and we have no control over that often or usually. So what I find most interesting about this metaphor of the burden is really a, a, inquiring into how and why we pick up the burden in the first place. So what drives us to keep picking it up, picking up all these loads and dragging them around with us? What, why is the bearer so comfortable with this encumbered life? Or actually, is it comfortable? Maybe it's really painful and often it is, yeah, but it's familiar and it's what we know. So we don't, we don't question it or we actually don't know how to get near it. After all, if we put the burden down, what then? Who or what am I without this burden? And what will I do without the burden pressing me down? In fact, we might ask, what would I be free to do without the burden? Or what, what would I be free from without the burden. It's a, I think it's a really interesting inquiry and there's some really beautiful poems that express this that I found. One um, by the Zen poet Hakuen who says, the monkey is reaching for the moon in the water. The monkey is reaching for the moon in the water. Until death overtakes him, he'll never give up. If he'd let go the branch and disappear in the deep pool, the whole world would shine with dazzling pureness. Now we can, I think, you know, from that, from that poem, you can see if all you have all that monkey has to do is let go of the branch. That's all we have to do, right? And yet it's much more difficult than that. And Rumi says, be empty of worrying. Think of who created thought. Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Move outside the tangle of fear thinking. Live in silence, flow down and down into always widening rings of being. So without a bearer, what, what burden can be picked up? So if I don't take experience so personally and I don't grasp onto it, can there exist anything that we can call a burden? In that case, it's all 
just experience, it's just life flowing through us and we respond appropriately in each moment. So all of these aspects are interconnected. We can't have the bearer of the burden, the burden, the putting, the picking up of the burden. They're, they're all interconnected. We can't have one without the other. As soon as we put down the burden, the bearer of the burden, the burden is gone. And I, I love this poem by May Sarton, which expresses, I think she expresses this beautifully in this poem about how when life lives through us, all of our energies, all of our, all of our functions, these modes of being just flow so naturally. And this is just part of this poem, it's quite long. Now to stand still, to be here, feel my own weight and density. The black shadow on the paper is my hand. The shadow of a word as thought shapes the shaper, falls heavy on the page, is heard. All fuses now, falls into place from wish to action, word to silence. My work, my love, my time, my face gathered into one intense gesture of growing like a plant. As slowly as the ripening fruit, fertile, detached and always spent, falls but does not exhaust the root, so all the poem is, can give, grows in me to become the song, made so and rooted by love. So we can only put down the burden once we recognize the burden as a burden and, and when we know how it came into play and also that we recognize when the burden isn't here because we need to know that open hand as much as we know the closed clenched hand, the clenched fist. And we need to know what brings about its ending. So this is the thrust of our in insight practice, I think, is this, um, this practice to see clearly what we're carrying, all these burdens that we're carrying, acknowledging it and letting it be here, really you know, giving, ro giving room for it. And that's what we're doing in the sitting practice this evening, just giving ourselves room to settle, you know, letting all the crazy thinking of the day and the energy trapped in the body, busyness and rushing to get here, etc. We, we might see all these burdens that we're carrying, but we, we're just widening, out, widening our embrace in these moments of sitting, these periods of sitting, to let all this be here so that we can actually acknowledge, ah, this, this is actually what's here, this is what I'm carrying. So that's the first step in this process. And then we can start to inquire once we're, settle, we're settling into that, that practice, we can start inquiring about, you know, how and why we picked those burdens up in the first place. I mean, there's, you know, there's endless conditioning around, around this. We can't explain everything about what we're carrying, but just in, inquiring into the nature of what it is to be human and carrying these loads. And seeing, you know, inquiring into who and what is doing the carrying. You know, what, what is this? What is this compulsion that's, that's carrying this load that continually clenches the fist and holds onto it? And then to, to feel into that sense of freedom, that knowing when we're not carrying it, this lightness we feel when we hear a bird singing and 
everything just softens. And we will walk outside and feel a gust of fresh air on our face and nothing else matters in that second, in that moment. And this is where mind, our mindfulness practice is so powerful because it actually brings us into full presence of those moments when we're recognizing, when we when we do recognize, ah, there's no carrying the load here. There's no burden right now in this being. So once we know this in our bodies and in our hearts and minds, what it feels like to carry the burden and what it feels like to when we we're not carrying the burden and how we got there you know what what are the what are the ways what are the, the strategies that we in in which we that we use to get to these places both to the suffering to the holding on the clinging on and to the freedom this is this is the inquiry and the practice how do we get to these places And this is all about the process of clearly seeing the, the dependent nature of what we're experiencing. And also I'd just like to add here as well that what's really necessary in this inquiry process is this, um, this attitude of, of tenderness that we bring to the inquiry because some of these some of these burdens that we carry are really painful they're traumatic and sometimes we also need external support to help us carry those those loads those burdens because those burdens have been with us often from very early years and we 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 don't have the capacity sometimes to carry them by ourselves that's really important that we don't just you know, forge into this meditation practice unsupported if we if we need to again widen that embrace and then let somebody else support us through those burdens or through the inquiry into those burdens. And once we develop some of this clear seeing into some of these these loads that we're carrying we see that we have a choice you know that the, the the distance opens up between me and this this angst i'm holding on to we see we can actually work with the aggregates in this case as a way to end our reactivity and resistance to life so the aggregates don't become something that, that are always subject to grasping, but we can distance ourselves slightly from, from this, um, the intensity of, of, of this uh, load that we're carrying. And we can see what triggers that picking up of the burden. And we can step back and ah, I'm not going to do that this time, this time. And we might do it a hundred times more. And yet we still, see that we have a, have a choice. There's a little bit more of an objective um, distance between us and, and the carrying. Even if we're still doing the carrying, but we can see we're doing the carrying and what led us there. We can give, us, give ourselves that compassionate um, care even while we're carrying the load. So it doesn't mean I do this practice, bang, it's gone, and you know I'm free of it. You know we, we have to dance with this for often for many years before suddenly we wake up one day and the load's gone. We're not we don't have it hanging over us anymore. And the writer um, Anais Nin uh, spoke to this beautifully when she said, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom.
Mm. The word risk there is so is so powerful. I think so, you know that can we can we risk that you know, just letting go, just opening the hand. So uh, finishing with the words of um, Thich Nhat Hanh, again about a bud. When he speaks about the ease of, of this letting go, the state that we, can, we find ourselves in when we're not carrying this burden anymore. Be a bud sitting quietly on the hedge. Be a smile, one part of wondrous existence. Stand here. There is no need to depart. Be a bud sitting quietly on the hedge. Be a smile, one part of wondrous existence. Stand here. There is no need to depart. Let's sit together quietly for a minute or two. <clears throat> 